in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. Government, the will of the people, that intrepid institution which protects our rights, ensures order, delivers justice, and alone guards society against the perils of chaos and lawlessness. This is the way government is often portrayed, from classrooms to the media to the sanctimonious speeches of politicians. But is this really the case? Is government truly as benevolent, as necessary, or as certain as we're led to believe? To find out, we need to start from the beginning, which means we gotta go back, way back, to a distant time from our own. When people watched cable TV, when books were read on paper, and when a certain Georgia sheriff was injured in the line of duty. Premiering on October 31st, 2010, The Walking Dead became an unlikely television sensation. Every Sunday, people would flock to their screens to see whether their favorite characters would live or die. But beyond bringing us such memorable characters and captivating story, this show gave us something else. While ostensibly being a show about the end of the world, The Walking Dead gives us a brilliant depiction of the beginning of civilization and the origin of the state. So lock up your crossbow and get your shitting pants on. I am Paladin, and this is The Walking Dead and How Government Began. No, 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 no. He's hurt! Shh, shh, shh. Hey, you look at me. You stay with me. You hear me? Shh, shh, shh. Okay. After being injured and falling into a coma, Sheriff's Deputy Rick Grimes miraculously wakes up three months later in the hospital. He turns to a vase of flowers, placed next to him seemingly moments ago, yet now appear dry and lifeless. He calls for a nurse, but no one answers. Something is very wrong. Exiting the room, Rick finds debris, blood, and bodies strewn across the halls. Things aren't any better on the outside either. Heaps of corpses fill the yard. Military vehicles lay abandoned. Essential services and personnel are nowhere to be found. All semblance of order and society simply gone. Rick soon discovers why. The dead walk the earth. Having to rapidly adapt to this brave new world, Rick sets off towards Atlanta, where he meets up with other survivors and reunites with his wife and son. Afterwards, over the course of totally innocuous events, Rick rises to become the group's leader in their quest for survival, a quest that mankind has treaded before. In this harsh and unforgiving world, Rick's group lives much like our prehistoric forebears did, as nomadic hunter-gatherers, constantly moving in search of food, water, and shelter, all the while trying to avoid the dangers lurking around every corner. Just as our ancestors contended with saber-toothed tigers, cave bears, and other giant predators, Rick and his fellow survivors contend with endless flesh-eating hordes of the undead. And just as our ancestors hunted mammoths, elk, and other animals for food, Rick's group hunts as well. We brought dinner. Along with scavenging the ruins of the old world for food and supplies, it is a bleak, despondent existence in which death looms ever-presently. But that is about to change.
Around 12,000 years ago, our ancestors made a discovery that would forever change the course of mankind. Agriculture. With the security of a constant and unmoving supply of food, people soon began to settle down and form communities. And with the greater abundance of food harvested seasonally, people within these communities were able to begin specializing and dividing their labor towards other endeavors, such as pottery, crafting, metallurgy, even more leisurely pursuits, such as entertainment and philosophy. Over time, these early communities would steadily grow and eventually coalesce into the first civilizations. In much the same way, Rick's group eventually foregoes their nomadic lifestyle for that of a settled community based on agriculture. Free from the ever-present specter of death and starvation, members of the group begin to specialize and divide their own labor. Some members specialize in agriculture, others in security, foraging, medicine, etc. Because of this, the group is able not only to survive, but to steadily increase their quality of life. At this point, it's prudent for later to mention that such communities formed and operated on a voluntary basis. Membership was not forced upon anyone, nor was leaving the group prohibited. In the case of Rick's group, people could come and go as they wished. Membership, however, was not a blank check. To ensure order and stability, members are required by the group to adhere to a set of rules, determined by a designated leader or collection of leaders, such as prohibitions on murder and theft, along with members having to fulfill a productive role within the community. The consequences for breaking such rules typically being dissociation and exile. In this way, Rick's group manages to carve out a relatively stable life for themselves. But good times never last. Rick! Come down here! You need to talk! Nature is violent. Every day, all across the world, animals fight and kill in a perpetual struggle for survival. For us, the same is no less true. All of human history, from the bones of our prehistoric ancestors to the mushroom clouds over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, testify to mankind's brutal tendency towards conflict, a testament that reaffirms itself all too well for Rick and his compatriots. In a fallen world, where every can of beans, every bottle of water, every bullet and gun can mean the difference between life and death, peace is rarely an option. Throughout their travels, Rick's group come into conflict with various other groups, Woodbury, Terminus, the Wolves, just to name a few. In every case, the conflicts that arise are essentially the same in nature. There's something that both groups want, but both cannot have. In the case of Rick's group and Terminus, for example, the termites want to use Rick and his group's bodies to make some sirloins, whereas Rick and his friends want to use their bodies to, you know, breathe. Huh. Who could have seen that coming? However, not every group Rick and his friends run into are murderous, cannibalistic pricks. Some aren't even pricks at all, just relatively peaceful people trying to survive, like them. One such group is Alexandria, a walled community which Rick's group are invited to join. And, over the course of totally innocuous events... Do it. Rick emerges once again as the leader. Sometime later, the Alexandrians come into contact with yet another group, the Hilltop. They're kind of pricks, though fortunately not of the murderous, cannibalistic variety. However, they do have food. A lot of food. Food that the Alexandrians are in fairly desperate need of. Though Gregory, the leader of the Hilltop, is not in a very giving mood. 
The Alexandrians, on the other hand, refused to take no for an answer. You can see where this is headed. But hold on a sec. While Rick and the Alexandrians could get the food by simply killing the hilltoppers, such a course of events is not without risk. While better armed, the Alexandrians in this instance are outnumbered, and some of them could be killed or seriously injured in the attempt. Plus, Rick and the Alexandrians would rather not murder and pillage in cold blood. So, what are they to do? Well, it just so happens that the hilltop has a problem with another hostile group, one that has been aggressively extorting them for supplies. Lacking the firepower to resist this group, the hilltop can do nothing but placate them. Rick and the Alexandrians, however, happen to have plenty of firepower, as well as experience dealing with hostile groups. Both parties have something the other wants. Thus, the Alexandrians decide to make an offer. They will eliminate the hostile group in exchange for food from the hilltop. In other words, a trade. A trade which Gregory accepts. While perhaps trivial on the surface, trade is in fact a game changer. While the Alexandrians gain less food immediately than they could have from just ransacking the hilltop, they still gain a lot without having to risk their lives or sanity. The same also holds for the hilltop. While they give up a large portion of their food in the short run, they stand to gain a lot more in the long run. By getting to keep the food, they'd no longer be forced to forego to the hostile group. Both parties walk away with more than they came in with, and on top of that, can return in the future to trade and gain more of what they want and need, all through peaceful, mutual exchange. This is the marvelous essence of free trade, the advent of which marked a turning point in human history. Whereas pillaging is a zero-sum game, where wealth is just violently transferred from one to another, the nature of mutual exchange allows for the further creation and accumulation of wealth over time. It's because of this that over the course of millennia, our species was able to advance from a largely meager existence as nomads and subsistence farmers to the level of affluence and prosperity we know today. Yet, despite the clearly tangible benefits of peaceful, mutual exchange, there still remain those for whom peace is not an option. After returning from the hilltop with the much-needed food, Rick makes good on their end of the bargain and leads the Alexandrians in an attack on what they believe to be the main base of the hostile group. You know the drill. The attack is successful. All members of the hostel group inside are eliminated, and incredibly, at no loss for the Alexandrians. Everything, it seems, went off without a hitch. But as the saying goes, no good deed goes unpunished. Lower your gun, prick. You with the cold python. We've got a Carol and a Maggie. I'm thinking that's something you want to chat about. The Alexandrians quickly discover that what they thought was the hostile group's main base was only a mere outpost. Turns out, the hostile group is much larger than they or the hilltop anticipated, and much more well-armed as well. Eventually, after a number of confrontations, Rick and his compatriots are overwhelmed and surrounded. Defeated and on their knees, the hostile group gives the Alexandrians a proper introduction to themselves and their leader. This in our pants yet? Boy, do I have a feeling we're getting close. 
The Saviors are a large group of survivors, led by a despotic, bat-wielding warlord named Negan. Like the bad guys who've come before, Negan and the Saviors want what Rick and the Alexandrians have, their food, their weapons, and especially their pool table. And all the pool cues and chalk, and I want it now! But unlike the murderous, cannibalistic pricks that have come before, Negan has a different way of doing things. Negan could easily kill the Alexandrians and take all their stuff then and there. Simple. The Saviors would still lose a couple guys, but they have plenty to spare. There is a bigger problem with this approach, however. Once the Saviors use up all the food, medicine, and whatever else they stole, they're right back at square one. They can't take more from the Alexandrians since they'd be busy being dead, so the Saviors would have to find some other luckless group to pillage from. People, however, are hard to come by in the apocalypse, and even so, once they'd kill the other luckless group and burn through their stolen goods, they'd be right back at square one, again. Eventually, like a Ponzi scheme, the Saviors would run out of people to steal from, at which point they would have no choice but to produce for themselves in order to survive. Although, if the Saviors were any good at producing for themselves, they'd have no reason to steal in the first place. Take it from the man himself. I'm not growing a garden. Fortunately, Negan has devised a clever way around this pillager's dilemma. Instead of killing the Alexandrians and taking all their stuff outright, he resolves to take only a portion of their stuff and lets the Alexandrians live so as to make more. I want you to work for me. You can't do that if you're dead now, can you? In this way, the saviors can return again and again to take more of the Alexandrians' wealth, and thus profit far more in the long run. But hold on, this sounds like a pretty rotten deal for the Alexandrians, which it is, they get nothing. So how's Negan supposed to get them to go along with this nefarious arrangement? The answer? An ultimatum. The same ultimatum, given from Babylon to the Israelites, from Rome to the Gauls, from the United States to the Indians, and from governments across the world today, to us. Give me your shit, or I will kill you. And just to make sure that the point gets across, examples have to be made. <laughs> That is a no-no. I need you to know me. So. Back to it. This is how government began. Not with a shake of hands. Not with the signing of paper but with one man standing over another, and a choice between submission and annihilation. With all that being said, most governments today appear to bear very little resemblance to a band of murderous thugs like the Saviors. After all, governments today use gavels rather than baseball bats, and constitutions instead of point-blank ultimatums. So if this is indeed how government began, how did those we know today come about? To answer this, we'll revisit Rick, Negan, Alexandria, and the Saviors, and over the course of two more videos, we'll see how the state organizes and asserts domination over its vassals, then how it evolves into what we know today. For now, though, Thank you for watching. I am Paladin, and I will see you next time.